Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Linda Brecker. I'm a rheumatologist with Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine, and I'm welcoming you today to the virtual Women's Health Lunch and Learn series. And this is um, a passion that was born out of a need for ongoing education for the community and women's health issues. So today I would like to welcome Dr. Sophia Siddiqui, who is a rheumatologist. She's an associate professor of medicine in the division of rheumatology and, and my esteemed colleague. And she'll be talking about diet and inflammatory disease. And then we will have Dr. Lauren Spivak, who is an obstetrician gynecologist who specializes in chronic pelvic pain, and she is the director of the Rowan Medicine Center for Chronic Pelvic Pain. So the way we structure this is that each, each of our provi providers, physicians will speak for 20 minutes, and then we will open it up to questions and answers that you can actually put in the chat session. And then I'm hoping Jane can hold on to those and then direct the questions at the end. But we're so happy to have you here. This is a concept that started in March. We're meeting on the second Wednesday of every month, and this will be our last meeting until the fall. So everybody gets the summer off. And starting in September, we will have other topics and we will hope to revitalize this valuable session. Uh, things on, uh, that are upcoming are sessions on migraine headaches, sessions on end of life planning, uh, possibly a session on pediatrics and mental health. So if you have any ideas or suggestions, certainly share them with us and we can certainly find the appropriate expert to provide those topics. So without any further ado, um, we will go to Dr. Siddiqui. Hello everyone, uh, it's been uh, a great pleasure to be here now. Um, I am, uh, this is the first time I'm doing this for the women's virtual lunch group, but I hope uh, to join more sessions and I hope uh, you all will benefit uh, from it. So uh, this is a very uh, interesting um, topic that I'm going to talk about. Just give me a second and I'm going to share my presentation. It's a question that I get asked daily in my practice. Um, and um, as you have heard, I'm a rheumatologist. So one of the commonest questions that I get uh, during my day-to-day -day practice is one is, what is inflammation? That is something that people ask me a lot. And uh, again, what can I do to prevent inflammation or help inflammation? Or what can I do to help my autoimmune disease? Or what can I do to, uh, what are the things that make my autoimmune disease worse? Uh, I get this uh, question on a daily basis and I just thought uh, it'll be a nice thing to go over this. Uh, so what is inflammation? In, in uh, year 2004, the Time magazine um, basically put this on their front page saying the secret killer, uh, autoimmune, infl inflammation, inflammation. So what is inflammation? Uh, inflammation is a process by which uh, your body's white cells and the things they make, which are the cytokines, um, protect you from infection from outside invaders, such as bacteria, uh, fungi, viruses. So if you want to give um, a daily example, if you see an accident uh, on the street and somebody calls 911 and the first responders come, basically um, they come and they try to take care of the situation. That's what the white blood cells and the other cells in our body uh, do to uh, to protect us. But in some cases and sometimes and in some diseases, even though the first responders don't leave once, usually what happens is when the first responders come, they clear up the situation and everybody leaves. And within a couple of hours, it's like there was no trace of it. That's the normal process. But in some situations, what happens is the first responders don't leave and they remain there and it causes a lot of disruption to the entire mechanism. And that's when autoimmune diseases happen and that's where chronic inflammation sets in. So if you have to think about it, acute versus chronic, acute inflammation uh, is immediate. It lasts for a few days and then it resolves. And a simple example is when you cut your finger or you have a small abscess and it 
resolves. But in chronic inflammation, the different cells involved uh, in the body and also it's delayed and it can last for many months or up to years or lifelong and it causes chronic tissue destruction and fibrosis and that's the disadvantage of uh, chronic inflammation. So how does one know uh, what are the signs of inflammation? So there are five pillars. There is the the heat, the redness, the swelling, the pain, uh, and the loss of function. Uh, these are the five pillars of inflammation. And you can see as an example, when somebody cuts their finger, there's pain, there's redness, there is swelling, there's loss of function. Uh, so those are the signs of inflammation for an acute inflammation. For chronic inflammation, you usually don't notice it. It's, it might not be visible. It might mostly it's internal. Uh, so uh, it's 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 different from acute inflammation. Um, in my specialty as a rheumatologist, I deal with autoimmune diseases and specific autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases can affect any part of the body, any organ system. Uh, so if it affects the brain, you have conditions like multiple sclerosis or Guillain-Barre syndrome. If it affects the blood, it's like lupus, uh, leukemias, GI tract, like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. It can affect the nervous system, causing diabetic neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, lungs, more like Wegener's. We call it GPA now, um, interstitial fibrosis, skin psoriasis, vitiligo, eczema, scleroderma, and muscles and joints. Uh, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, or polymyalgia rheumatica. So all these diseases are autoimmune diseases that affect the immune system. Um, and when they do affect the immune system, uh, okay, so uh, we had a slide about acute versus chronic inflammation. These are the signs of inflammation. Um, we talked a little bit about the autoimmune diseases that affect the various organ systems. So as rheumatologists, we mentioned we treat all these diseases. And one of the commonest questions is, what do I eat? What should I not eat? So this comes uh, to the topic of today where, uh, you know, talk topic about anti-inflammatory diet. So I actually looked for anti-inflammatory diet books on Amazon and there are like 10,000 results. So it's a very popular hot topic. Everybody wants to talk about it. Everybody wants to read about it, know more about it and rightfully so. Um, so uh, there are a lot of anti-inflammatory diet handouts for beginners. Uh, how to start, what to do, but I just wanted to review a little bit of the data and what the scientific world says about anti-inflammatory diets. So what do clinical studies say? So the most important aspect of an anti-inflammatory diet is to stabilize the insulin and to reduce the intake of omega-6 fatty acids. So we know that we have the omega-6 fatty acids and we have the omega-3 fatty acids and the omega-6 are considered to be the bad ones. The omega-3 are supposed to be the good ones. The other one is, uh, the other big point is the treatment lies in establishing, re-establishing hormonal and genetic balance to generate satiety instead of constant hunger. So that's another concept that we shouldn't have these surges of hunger uh, and so insulin surges, and that itself controls inflammation. So we'll talk a little bit more about the specific anti-inflammatory diet. And finally, a diet rich in col colorful, non-starchy vegetables, uh, um, and which with adequate amounts of polyphenols that we'll talk about that help inhibit um, NFK beta, which is one of the important inflammatory cytokines um, and a primary target of inflammation, but also activate the AMP kinase. So what are polyphenols? Whenever you read any book or any article on anti-inflammatory diet, the two recurring words would be polyphenols and then omega-3 fatty acids. So polyphenols are a large family of naturally occurring organic compounds characterized by multiple phenol units. A phenol unit almost looks like a hexagon and there are multiple phenol units. Uh, they're abundant in plants and they're structurally diverse. They include flavonoids, tannic acid, and again, 
del tannin and some of them has been have been historically used as you know vegetable ties or tanning garments so the foods that are rich in polyphenols you can see these colorful foods uh, blackberries blueberries grapes uh, strawberries um, all the berries basically then you also have the plums the dark chocolate uh, black tea green tea uh, pomegranate, red wine, hazelnut, cocoa powder, all these things have very high content of polyphenols and they're all considered to be anti-inflammatory. The next big thing uh, that you will read whenever you uh, read about anti-inflammatory diet are omega-3 fatty acids. So there are two major classes of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So just for us as a background, monounsaturated fatty acids are not good. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, good. Polyunsaturated fatty acids are two types, omega-3 and omega-6, and omega-3 are the good ones. Uh, so you have three types of omega-3 fatty acids. You have the ALA, the EPA, and the DHA, uh, and all three of them are good for you. So what are the sources of omega-3 fatty acids? Uh, you have black walnuts, you have chia seeds, uh, you have the vegetables, the beans, and these are for people who are vegetarian. Uh, for people who eat fish, uh, high sources are salmon, tuna, um, and, um, do, and mackerel. These are sources of omega-3 fatty acids. So, one of the biggest studies that uh, was published in 2018 is um, it's called the Tomorrow Study, where they actually uh, saw head to head. They actually studied patients with rheumatoid arthritis and they put them on a Mediterranean diet, which has high levels of polyphenols and omega-3 fatty acids, and they actually saw their disease activity. And they saw that um, that Mediterranean diet, people who are on it suppress rheumatoid arthritis disease activity. And daily monounsaturated fatty acid intake, a component of the Mediterranean diet score, may suppress disease activity. So it was a really good study. Um, and one of, uh, I mean, one of the few studies which actually did a trial and put patients with rheumatoid arthritis on Mediterranean diet and saw their disease activity and adjusted for other factors. So the, what is a Mediterranean diet? What is an anti-inflammatory diet is now synonymous with a Mediterranean diet. So what is it? Um, so every day, each meal, vegetables, fruits, whole wheat, grain, olive oil, beans, nuts, and legume do this every day. You're supposed to eat this every day. At least twice a week, fish and seafood weekly moderate portions, poultry, egg, cheese, and yogurt, and less often meats and sweets. And in moderation, wine and lots of water, we can't um, underestimate the importance of drinking a lot of water. So that's the, in just, in short, a Mediterranean diet. Um, and what are pro-inflammatory foods? So talking about what we shouldn't be eating is high refined sugars is something we should avoid. Gluten is something that we can and should avoid. Uh, trans and saturated fatty acids, uh, dairy products like milk and cheeses, red meat and vegetables. In some patients, tomatoes, eggplants, and potatoes, they have solanine, they can trigger inflammation, not in everybody, but these are some things that we have to uh, Keep and uh, keep in mind. So fish, we talked about fish. So how much uh, do we fish eat fish uh, every day? How many times a week? So uh, it's basically two to recommend three to four ounces of fish twice a week. Uh, that's by the AHA, the American Heart Association. Uh, arthritis experts, uh, rheumatologists, we say more is better. Uh, why? Because fish is a very good source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and in one study, uh, patients who consumed high level of omega-3 fatty acids had lower levels of CRP and interleukin-6. And we know that CRP and interleukin-6 are big uh, cytokines, big factors that we uh, are increased in all our uh, inflammatory diseases, especially rheumatoid arthritis. Um, also, researchers have shown that uh, patients who take fish oil supplements have decreased joint swelling and pain and decreased 
uh, morning stiffness. Uh, the best sources, as we mentioned, were the salmon, tuna, sardines, anchovies, scallops, and other cold water fish. If you hate fish, then you know we always have omega-3 uh, pills, capsules around taking around 600 to 1,000 mg of fish oil daily, who can help with joint pain and stiffness. Um, so th that is something to think about. The next thing are nuts and seeds. How much? Approximately 1.5 ounces of nuts daily. Um, one ounce is one handful approximately. Uh, and why should we be doing this? Uh, one study confirmed that over a 15 year period, men and women who consumed nuts had 51% lower chance of dying from an inflammatory disease. Um, and then the other study found that lower levels of vitamin B6 uh, patients who had lower levels of vitamin B6 had higher levels of inflammatory markers, and vitamin B6 is very high in nuts and seeds. And the best sources, of course, are walnuts, pine nuts, pistachios, and almonds. Fruits and vegetables, um, nine or more servings daily. One serving includes almost one cup of vegetables or fruit or two cups of raw leafy green vegetables. It sounds like a lot, but it's pretty simple to incorporate if you have this in every meal. Um, they are, fruits and vegetables are loaded with antioxidants, vitamin C and vitamin K and anthocyanins, and all these are proven anti-inflammatory um, uh, substances. The best sources are any any of the fruits and vegetables. Uh, the berries are the best. Spinach, kale, and broccoli are amazing. Again, keep an eye on tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplants because they could trigger an inflammatory response in some patients. Uh, next thing is olive oil, um, two to three tablespoons daily. Again, a big part of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, the the cool thing about olive oil is it has um, oleocanthal, which is very similar to taking ibuprofen or naproxen, the NSAIDs. Uh, it inhibits the activity of the COX enzymes, and COX enzymes are the ones which kind of drive inflammation, and all these NSAIDs, they block the COX enzymes. So oleocanthal also, oleocanthal also blocks the activity of the Cox enzymes. So extra virgin olive oil is great, but also if you don't like the smell or the taste of olive oil, avocado and safflower oils are also good enough and walnut oil is also really good. Uh, the next thing is whole grains. So how much of whole grains? Around six ounces of grains per day. At least uh, three of them should be from whole grains. Uh, it could be brown rice. It could be whole wheat bread. Um, studies have shown that fiber and fiber rich foods lower the levels of CRP, which is an inflammatory marker and very important substance to drive all inflammation. Uh, the best source are best sources are foods made with entire grain uh, like whole wheat flour, oatmeal, burgol, brown rice, and quinoa. Um, having said that, an uh, important thing to keep in mind is gluten. There are certain patients who have celiac disease and gluten, which um, is there in all the whole grain food can worsen inflammation. So one has to be cognizant of that. And if not, if somebody does not even have a formal celiac disease diagnosis, some patients can be gluten sensitive. So always listen to your body and see what your body tells you. Uh, there's more data on omega-3 fatty acids, which shows that they decrease the production of inflammatory uh, eicosanoids and cytokines, and they down-regulate NLRP3, which is an important factor in driving inflammation. Uh, fiber has an anti-inflammatory effect, and a high um, omega-3 levels in the cell membranes of the RBCs, uh, they reduce the risk of formation of CCP, which causes uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So all these uh, studies do show and do um, corroborate that omega-3 fatty acids, dietary fiber, polyphenols are all very helpful. Uh, I want to make a small note on herbal medications, medicines. I mean, there are a lot of herbal medicines out there. There are a lot of things out there which say, oh, they reduce inflammation. But actual scientific studies have been done on two things. One is turmeric and one is ginger. 
So turmeric has been proven to reduce your inflammatory markers, uh, patients uh, reduce joint pain and inflammation, and also ginger supplementation has improved immunity and uh, reduced the inflammation gene expression in patients, and there have been trials done on this. So um, incorporating turmeric and ginger in your food while you cook is a is a good uh, way to do it uh, patients who don't tolerate or don't like the taste of it their turmeric tablets that are available uh, their ginger tablets which are available which people can take uh, and it'll help with the inflammation um, so off note i i really want to make a note here saying that once we have a diagnosis of autoimmune disease and you have an established diagnosis it's important to treat it with the medications with the fda approved medications and these supplements or changing your diet is not a replacement for the medications you have to take the medications you have to get the appropriate therapy and all these diet modifications and the herbal supplements are in conjunction or as an adjuvant to the actual treatment. So never think of it as a replacement, but it's it's in association with the regular medication. So other common questions I get asked uh, are, uh, does gluten affect my arthritis? So if you have celiac disease, then definitely it does. But some patients, as I mentioned, are just gluten sensitive and they don't actually have the celiac disease. So avoiding gluten has shown to improve pain scores and improve functionality. So if you want to avoid gluten, then definitely one should try it, but also be patient because it takes approximately two to three weeks. It takes the body two to three weeks to get rid of uh, the body to get the body to get rid of gluten completely so you might not see the effects immediately but after two to three weeks you can actually see the effects the other thing are you know the youngsters especially they're so aware um, they ask me about FODMAPs uh, FODMAPs stand for fermentable oligo monosaccharides and polyols the basically short chain carbs like fructose galactose fructans galactans uh, that are resistant to digestion they can be even in some fruits and some vegetables uh, and in, and instead of these short chain carbs being uh, absorbed into your bloodstream they reach the end of your gut and they cause irritation and they can cause diarrhea so uh, these things are something uh, to be aware of something that you should note that you know are there certain types of fruits or there are certain types of foods which are triggering diarrhea um, and that could be because of FODMAPs so generally to help with all this I would suggest uh, keep a food journal log in the food and the timing of symptoms and see if there is a correlation please please read the labels um, of everything you know when you buy it uh, try to unprocess your diet as much as you can you know the best way i tell my patients there's a lot out there about anti-inflammatory diet but the if I had to say one thing, it would be don't eat processed food. Uh, so pre pre made meals, things that are already you know in the freezer, putting them in the microwave or the oven. Please try to avoid that because that's all processed food. Uh, so try to cook from scratch. It's hard. It's a, it's a lifestyle change, but that's the best way for all my patients who have autoimmune disease and aim for a balanced diet, whether you call it a Mediterranean diet, uh, whether you call it a low carb diet, whether you call it uh, whatever name you want to give it, but aim for a balanced diet. There should be a bit of everything and everything in moderation. So my um, advice or my suggestion is it's a constant battle. Make the right choice. Make the right choice at every meal. Make the right choice for yourself. Um, and uh, yes, diet has a big, uh, big, big uh, role to play. Um, some people say you are what you eat. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of that phrase, but uh, I would say make the right choice. Um, and I would happy to take any questions. We we did have one question. Uh, is sure. there a difference between organic dairy and regular dairy if you predominantly eat organic? Um, so the the difference between organic dairy and regular dairy is in the hormones, actually more than 
um, so so organic dairy, regular dairy are da uh, dairy that you get from uh, animals which have been treated hormonally with hormones to increase the productivity or to increase the produce. And organic are usually uh, dairy products that you get from animals that have not been treated genetically or hormonally. So theoretically, uh, I think going organic is better for inflammation, but there is no data. There is no data that going having organic dairy is better than regular dairy for inflammation but it has but we do know um, that organic dairy definitely has um, you know people who take organic dairy they have lesser um, chances of having pcos have lesser chances of you know, the children who ha take organic dairy, they attain puberty at a uh, regular uh, time versus patients or kids who have regular dairy have attained puberty earlier. We have data on all of that, but uh, not really uh, specific data on inflammation. Great, thank you so much. That was wonderful. If anybody has further questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try and either get them at the end or potentially we could email you with the answers. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Lauren Spivak. And uh, Dr. Spivak is um, an assistant professor of medicine at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine and the director of the Rowan Medicine Center for Chronic Pelvic Pain. So take it away, Lauren. All right. So thank you so much for having me speak today. Um, I assume you can see my screen. Yes, everything's okay. great. Okay, great. So today I'm going to be talking about endometriosis. So just as an introduction, um, I joined Rowan back in um, August, about 10 months ago. I completed my residency training at Cooper and then finished a minimally invasive GYN surgery fellowship at the University of Rochester with a focus on chronic pelvic pain. Um, so I'm going to be talking about endometriosis um, as it relates to it's not just a bad period and tackling endometriosis. So the objectives of today's lecture um, are to define chronic pelvic pain as that is a large part of what I do and endometriosis does fall under that category or umbrella. I'm going to discuss the prevalence and impact of endometriosis. Um, we're going to talk about evaluating endometriosis as one very common etiology of chronic pelvic pain and then to discuss the appropriate management of endometriosis. So just to get started, because chronic pelvic pain is a lot of what I do and endometriosis is often a reason why people have, I wanted to just explain what that is. So there is no consensus on a definition of chronic pelvic pain, but generally it refers to pain that is three to six months in duration occurring below the umbilicus and is severe enough that it causes functional impairment, um, requires treatment, and is unrelated to pregnancy. And so this is often, almost always, you know, endometriosis for sure falls into chronic pelvic pain. It often overlaps with abdominal pain, so abdominal and pelvic pain can go together. It's constant um, in character or it can be episodic, and it is an end symptom um, with a myriad of underlying causes. So as far as the etiologies of chronic pelvic pain, it is a very, very long list. Um, but today, you know, in general, a systems based approach can be very useful in. Understanding chronic pelvic pain, we're going to be talking about endometriosis falling under the gynecologic um, systems based approach. So endometriosis, what is it? Um, so there, uh, the pathophysiology of endometriosis is unknown. Um, there are several different theories about what it is, how it happens. Retrograde menstruation is one of the big theories, um, along with chalemic metaplasia, which is essentially growth of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. There are certainly components of immunologic dysfunction and lymphatic and hematologic spread. Um, overall, the pathogenesis does seem to be multifactorial, and it includes this ectopic endometrial tissue with implants outside of the pelvis. Um, with altered immunity, imbalanced cell proliferation and apoptosis, aberrant endocrine signaling, and genetic factors involved as well. 
But ultimately what happens is you have this endom ectopic implants of endometrium that require both glands and stroma to be present that are occurring outside of the lining of the uterus. So most commonly that location is the ovaries in the pelvis, the anterior and posterior cul-de-sac, so near the bladder, near the rectum, in the ovarian fossa, which is where the ovaries sit, and the uterosacral ligaments. However, endometriosis has been found outside of the pelvis. Um, the appendix certainly is kind of considered the, the pelvis, so that's always examined, but more rare would be the diaphragm, the lungs, the brain, and the pancreas. So it has been found in other places, but that's not the most common. The prevalence of endometriosis is about 10% of the female pelvic, uh, female population. 70 to 80% of patients that present with chronic pelvic pain are found to have endometriosis. So that's all comers. Now there's been more um, study and attention given to adolescents um, because they're often a group that that's when a lot of the pain starts, but they're not um, necessarily diagnosed as early. So the prevalence in adolescence is not exactly known, but is thought to be about 60 to 70 percent of those that do come with pelvic pain to the office. Um, one to seven percent of asymptomatic women who are undergoing sterilization are found to have endometriosis. Um, so it is also a disease that can be found just incidentally. About 40% of adolescents with Mullerian anomalies, specifically um, obstructive anomalies, end up having endometriosis, and this goes along with the retrograde menstruation theory. 50% of those with infertility are found to have endometriosis. It's most commonly diagnosed between 25 and 35 years of age, but that's not to say that younger people, premenarchal and or postmenopausal women don't have it, it's just much less common. Um, just as sort of a side note, average age of menarche is thought to be between, is, is about 11.8 to 14.2 years of age, and the average pain onset for those with endometriosis can happen 1 to 5.9 years after. So these young women can be presenting at age 12, 13 um, with the starts of what is endometriosis. Um, and then of note, there's not a correlation between the amount of endometriosis and the amount of pain. So someone could have an abdomen or a pelvis that is full of uh, endometriosis without any pain, and potentially it is discovered with an infertility workup, or they can have one implant like the area seen in this um, <clears throat> image um, where they have a significant implant here, but this could be their main endometriosis and this could be causing significant pain. So that is an important thing to know. As for the risk factors for endometriosis, there are several. Nulliparity is one of them, so not ever having been pregnant, which goes um, you know, along with this prolonged exposure to endogenous estrogen. So these are the girls that get their periods early, typically less than 13 years old, or menopause late. Um, and also those with shortened menstrual cycles, typically less than 27 days. Heavy menstrual bleeding is also a risk factor, as well as the Mullerian anomalies, which we talked about, mainly the outflow tract um, anomalies, which cause obstruction and retrograde menstruation. Low BMI is another risk factor. In some literature, you may see asthma as another risk factor, um, but family history in general, there is definitely a genetic component, although that's still being elucidated. So for the symptoms of endometriosis, the, the thing to remember is the three Ds. So dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and dyskesia. So dysmenorrhea being painful periods, that's often the thing that people will present with or come to the office complaining of. It usually starts out in a cyclic fashion where periods are incredibly painful. These are women that maybe as children had to miss school because their pain was so severe, they have to miss work. But over time, the dysmenorrhea, it actually turns into acyclic pelvic pain where they're having pain outside of just their menses. Um, dyspareunia, so painful sex often, it's not necessarily um, because of the location of it, but sometimes because of what endometriosis causes, which is an inflammatory reaction, um, it can cause a lot of pain. And so these people have pain frequently from the first time they start having sex. 
Um, and then the dyskesia for painful bowel movements may indicate involvement of the bowel for endometriosis as that is a place where it's found, but it may also just be as a result of the location and the and the inflammation. It's important to ask about the temporal relationship to menses with pain, um, the temporal relationship with intercourse as it relates to the dyspronia, and then the character of the pain as people can describe it in different ways, but it can um, you know, certainly help you. And also the intensity of the pain, you know, when it's best, worst, average, because there's certain um, ways that the pain presents with endometriosis, worsening during the period, getting better once the bleeding stops, starting again before the period, and then kind of extending as the pain um, as the pain goes on. As well as other symptoms, so infertility is a symptom of endometriosis. So sometimes when people are being worked up for endometriosis, um, whether it's via ultrasound and it's found in the form of an endometrioma, as noted below, or a laparoscopy, it can be seen. Um, and then heavy menstrual bleeding is another symptom. But the, the main ones really to think about are those three Ds. All right, so in terms of the um, workup of endometriosis. So first of all, patients often present to their PCP for evaluation. So these are often the first people that are seeing these patients before they're being referred to a specialist like a gynecologist or um, someone, a gynecologist specializing in surgery for endometriosis. Studies do range, but patients are seen by an average of three physicians before they get a diagnosis. And many patients will come in saying, you know, I was told or I thought my my periods were supposed to be painful. And these are people that are having to miss school and work because of how painful their periods are. So for the workup, there are no labs that are specific for endometriosis. By way of tumor markers, CA125 is a tumor marker usually followed for ovarian cancer, um, but in other sorts of inflammation in the pelvis and peritoneal surfaces, it can be elevated. So we do find it elevated often in endometriosis. It is not a lab that should be per, should be done or that can follow disease. For imaging, um, often imaging is normal because a lot of endometriosis is superficial, meaning it's on the peritoneal surfaces. And so um, only with surgery, with laparoscopy and the eye, can you see it. However, transvaginal ultrasound is the preferred imaging because that's going to be able to show you whether there are any ovarian cysts in the form of endometriomas. And there are certain um, skilled ultrasound techniques that can show if there's any sort of rectovaginal septum thickening or nodules or bladder nodules um, or just the movement of the organs against each other um, to show any evidence possibly of endometriosis. But often an ultrasound is totally normal. If there's a suspicion for deeper endometriosis, which is usually a lesion that's more than five millimeters, MRI can be considered. And this is often really for surgical planning purposes. Um, for diagnosis, it is absolutely okay to empirically start medications. Um, and we'll talk about those medications. Surgery is necessary for definitive pathologic results because what you need is gland, endometrial glands and stroma. Um, but it doesn't have to occur to make a presumptive diagnosis. It has been reported that via um, a diagnosis of endometriosis via laparoscopy occurs typically uh, nearly seven years after onset of symptoms. So what this is to say is that there still is often a delay in diagnosis and treatment. As far as treatment goes, NSAIDs are a mainstay of initial treatment for dysmenorrhea. It's not this specific to endometriosis per se, but in everything you'll read, you always want to try NSAIDs to help with pain. Um, but the main treatments for endometriosis are hormonal and surgical. So hormonal suppression is really aimed at um, some of what's understood to be causing endometriosis, which is that it's often a disease fed by estrogen. So um, if we can, you know, and and pain caused by um, menses and all the all of the complicated things happening that cause endometriosis pain. So there's combined hormonal birth control, which can be um, oral contraceptives, ring, um, with his, which is uh, orthoevra or used to be known as orthoevra now has a different name, the patch as well. Um, these all basically have estrogen and progesterone and 
inhibit the cycling with ovulation and everything like that. I say continuous because often pain is worse with periods. So continuous means that these patients skip the week where they would have a withdrawal bleed and often their pain is significantly better when they don't have that bleed. There are progesterone only forms of hormonal suppression, which are very commonly used as well for endometriosis. Depo is an injection form. Norethindrone is a pill form of progesterone. The levonorgestrel IUD, as well as the Nexplanon, are all things that can be tried, and it's really individualized based on side effects, to what patients can tolerate, what they're willing to take. When some of these don't work, there are two medications specifically for endometriosis, Lupron, which is a GnRH agonist, um, which can have significant side effects by way of menopausal symptoms, vaginal dryness, hot flashes, mood changes, and often are not very well tolerated, especially by younger patients. But that can certainly be tried when other things have not worked. In the last couple of years, there's a new medication that is a pill form. Lupron is typically an injection. The pill form is Orlissa, also known as Elagalix. It is a GnRH antagonist, so it does have a lot of the same effects of Lupron by way of those menopausal symptoms, but there are two different doses. It can be taken in a pill form, so you're not stuck kind of with that injection, having to wait out those symptoms, and you can also vary the dose. Um, in terms of surgery, so surgical resection, um, you know, is the mainstay of treatment, although there's debate about ablation, meaning really burning these lesions versus excising them or removing them altogether. Um, the, the, a lot of endometriosis surgeons will do excision, which is what I primarily do unless I can't, um, you know, safely excise it because of its location and burning it makes more sense. The, the, what's helpful with excision is that you're able to actually send the specimen and get that diagnosis about whether there are glands in stroma because endometriosis can look all different ways. Um, the endometriosis does often recur. It really, you need to counsel patients about it being a chronic disease. Um, there are certainly treatments that make it less likely to recur, but it often does. So for images, just to get a sense of what it looks like, because it can look all different ways, and this is just a, a smattering, but the top left corner, what's circled, you can see um, it can be very subtle, but sort of this whitened look. Um, it has a little bit of fibrosis. These are endometriosis lesions. In the top right corner, you can see some increased vascularity, but what the arrows are pointing to are some of these classic, um, what are called powder burn lesions or black lesions. So this is endometriosis over here. Um, this is more vesicular in appearance. This is another way that endometriosis looks. And then down below, you have again this whitened area that is fibrotic and some increased vascularity. So you really have to have a trained eye to look very carefully at all the peritoneal surfaces um, to be able to remove what you think might be endometriosis um, for treatment. So by way of treatment, Medical treatment of endometriosis may reduce pain or proliferation of it, but it does not provide treatment in and of itself for infertility. So when is surgery indicated? So it's indicated when something called hydrosalpinges are present. So that's when you have a dilation of the fallopian tube, um, which can be seen with um, various conditions, but endometriosis being one of them. But if there's hydrosalpinges present and infertility is an issue, Surgery is indicated specifically to remove the tubes as they can be toxic to the embryo. And the presence of these um, dilated fallopian tubes can, can affect um, assisted reproductive technology outcomes, decrease them by about 50%. Surgery is indicated when there's pain. So certainly medication can be tried first. You know, we go from conservative, more, more conservative treatment to, to less conservative as we go along, but pain is definitely an indication. And then when very large endometriomas are present as they can cause pain, but also if a patient is undergoing treatment um, for infertility, they can increase infection risk during oocyte retrieval. Surgery may improve, in, uh, improve fertility through a variety of mechanisms that are 
beyond the scope of this lecture, but an re overall reduction in inflammation and a restoration of pelvic anatomy. So I'm not sure how much you know this image um, makes sense to people looking, but essentially this is just showing um, the very distorted anatomy in the pelvis that is from endometriosis. So this is the uterus. Everything is stuck to everything else. The bowel is stuck to the back of the uterus. You can't even really see normal anatomy. I don't even know where there's an ovary. So certainly just you can understand how infertility can be affected by endometriosis in this way when you just don't have the normal anatomy present. So as it relates to endometriosis and infertility, about 10 to 15 percent of women who have issues with infertility have endometriosis. 30 to 50 percent of women with endometriosis are infertile, but that does not mean <clears throat> that women with endometriosis should be told that they're not going to be able to get pregnant. And I do often see a lot of women who come to me having been told that by their doctor, and that is not a true statement, and that can be very distressing to patients, but it can make getting pregnant more difficult. Again, there are many mechanisms which are beyond the scope of what I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, as it relates to infertility and endometriosis, often the pain component that goes along with endometriosis also limits the ability um, to you know, be able to try to get pregnant. So that is another thing to explore with patients. Um, as it relates to the recurrent rate, recurrence rates of endometriosis, I just wanted to basically finish um, on that note. Just so there was a study by the Cleveland Clinic um, that was done in 2008 that was looking at recurrence rates. So this is just to to show the different types of treatment and what recurrence looks like. So with just removal of the lesions alone, um, patients had reoperation rates nearly 60% at seven years. Um, and this is something that I talk to patients about in terms of just explaining, you know, we can start with a more conservative surgery because certainly not everyone in any way is ready or needing a hysterectomy. But as you can see with a hysterectomy, reoperation rates do fall to 23% at seven years. So that's meaning these people have more pain control for longer periods of time. Now, the definitive treatment of endometriosis is going to be a hysterectomy with removal of both tubes and ovaries. That is not going to be a thing that is going to be beneficial to a lot of younger people that might not be ready for that or are still interested in childbearing. And there are the benefits of the ovaries um, that are not, you know, at this point, used to be ovaries would be removed. That's not the thinking these days in people who are treating endometriosis. And in fact, in this, so the reoperation rates with this Definitive surgery is 9% at seven years, so that's very good. Um, but in women age 30 to 39, removing the ovaries didn't significantly improve the surgery free time, which is actually very good um, in that keeping the ovaries when women are still having a lot of benefit from the ovaries is beneficial, but doesn't change the, um, you know, the pain free amount of time that they have. There was a more recent um, study that was done by Solomon et al., which was done in 2017 and was a retrospective study with over 50,000 patients looking at retreatment rates of um, different types of surgery. So for just excision alone, that was 35% retreatment, meaning that they needed surgery again at eight years versus with hysterectomy that they had 5% retreatment. So sometimes it's a little bit of a, um, these patients with endometriosis don't just have one surgery or take one medication as it's a chronic disease. They may have more than one surgery and you know, as they change throughout their life and their um, wishes and desires change, that informs the surgery or the decisions they make about treatment. So the take home points, Today, or that endometriosis is a common cause of chronic pelvic pains, which should always be up there when you're seeing um, someone about having pain. The th delays in diagnosis are very common, um, as I as I spoke about, and people see multiple physicians until they usually get a diagnosis, and many years can go by until they may actually have surgical confirmation. Um, but endometriosis is a chronic disease which can and should be managed medically and or surgically and there are successful treatments, um, and that it's definitely okay to start treatment empirically, and that would be encouraged um, with medication. So that's the end of this lecture. Oops, yep, <laughs> that is the end of the lecture. Um, so if there are any questions at this time, please feel free to let me know, and I'm always available by email if you have any questions or anything else. Is diet considered to be a factor? 
Sorry, what was that? Is diet considered to be a factor? Um, it's really not. No, that has not been found to to change um, anything as it relates to endometriosis. Now that's a good question. Any other questions? Uh, there is one question here. Uh, what causes menopausal women to be diagnosed? What causes them to be diagnosed? Well, I mean, the thing that's that's can be confusing about it is that a lot of the mechanisms of endometriosis are thought to be due to estrogen, and so often endometriosis improves after um, cessation of menses when estrogen levels go down. So this is part of what is not fully understood about endometriosis. So why do premenarchal girls get it? Why is it found there? Why is it found in postmenopausal women? There's not necessarily an answer to that, except for the fact that there have to be other mechanisms as to, you know, what is causing the endometriosis. So, you know, the other theories of cholemic metaplasia, the immunologic dysfunction, um, that could all be possible. I myself have never seen um, endometriosis first diagnosed in a postmenopausal woman, um, but you know the quotes are about two to five percent with both prior to women getting their period and postmenopausal. But it's definitely much more uncommon. Well, I thank everybody for participating and for showing up. And just so you know that these uh, sessions are recorded and you can find them on YouTube. And if you need a link, you can certainly contact Jane Elliott, who has been our host and has helped us to make this, this worthy event happen. Um, again, we're really open to suggestions and are just very happy to see everybody participating. So thanks again to Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. Spivak and everybody who attended the session. Have a great day.